but yeah so hey everybody um this is culture and this is electron culture and i'm going to be talking about all the really awesome things that have to go with culture because culture is a part of anthropology so you may forgive me i may have said something before not bad but i may have said something about culture before and now, because I'm doing it for the third time, I, I think I've said it, but then again, I may not have said it, and I want to make sure I say everything. So if for whatever reason something doesn't come up or I neglect something, it's it's not my fault. So <laughs> send me an email. I promise you I can clarify things if you're not really sure about it. So here we go. Um, culture itself is broken down into seven basic elements. Now, um, you see here the language, norms, values, beliefs, social collectives, statuses and roles and cultural integration all that stuff i'll be talking about in like you know the next 20 minutes so that's a really really important part of anthropology now anthropologists um, study culture if you look at our history our evolution our natural selection all the darwin stuff um, there has to have been at some point in our human history a divergence a break People went and lived in the subarctic region. Some people went and lived in the desert region. Some people were living in different parts of the world. That shaped their culture. Um, we're all human, yes, um, but our language and our rules and our beliefs and our thoughts, all of that stems from where we are in the world. And so our culture would be that distinguishing factor between what makes some people one group and what makes some people a different group. <coughs> Excuse me. So... How, how do we understand culture? Um, we understand culture through an ethnocentric lens. Now, what you're not going to see that here, so you might want to jot that down. Ethnocentric, that's E-T-H-N-O-C-E-N-T-R-I-C. -E I've, I've spelled that. I'm going through deja vu right now because I've said this before. Um, what it is, it's basically the belief that your culture is better than everyone else's. Now, anthropologists who have studied cultures immerse themselves in cultures and they get right involved in the middle of a culture and they try to lose the bias of, of well, my culture is better than your culture. Um, because if you really want to truly appreciate a culture for what it is, you can't have that attitude. The minute you start saying, well, mine is better than yours, you immediately place yours higher on a pedestal and tend to ignore the finer points of what other people are experiencing. In, in many ways, it's almost like, you know, um, if I go into a mindset, for example, I hate garlic. I, I don't, I'm just saying that I do. And I go to a restaurant that serves food primarily with garlic in it. The minute I go in there and say, well, I hate garlic, I'm not going to open up any opportunity for me to like anything that's there because I immediately say, well, I can't stand garlic, so I'm not going to eat it because I hate it. Um, and and that limits my possibilities of understanding what makes this restaurant so good. So understanding culture really is that whole idea of, of losing your ethnocentrism and uh, accepting other cultures for what they are. Um, so what is culture? Well, as Canadians, because we're all Canadians in some degree, you know, some more Canadian than others. And I'm not saying that to be derogatory. I'm saying that some people are first, second, third, fourth, tenth generation Canadians. Um, and that plays significantly into who you are. Um, and so what makes us Canadian? Well, our multiculturalism for some people makes us Canadian. Um, perhaps it's some of the food that we eat that makes us Canadian. And we can talk about any other culture like that, right? Is it the sports that we play or, or the cultural um, gatherings that we have? Is it any animal that identifies us with who, you know, who we are? It's kind of weird to say that, but it does happen. Or do we identify ourselves with, and this is not a mistake or a joke, with uh, celebrities or people who and not necessarily have been elected. I don't think anybody got together in Canada and said, hey, Justin Bieber, you're our guy. Go out there and tell the world about Canadians. Um, I think a lot of people would probably say, dear God, please don't send him out. Um, and we kind of try to avoid stereotyping group of people based on one person who just happens to be you know, in the spotlight of the media. It's not particularly fair and it's not particularly accurate. Um, and so as Canadians, we kind of struggle with that because, you know, as Canadians, we also have cultural values, like right? we're very polite and we often say sorry, um, even though we should be saying excuse me, we say I'm sorry. Um, and that's, you know, who we are. But there's a history, there's a reason behind that. There's, there's just quite a bit that goes into that cultural understanding. And as Canadians, you know, if you travel around the world, people say, oh, you're American. And you're like, no, I am not American. <laughs> I'm Canadian. 
there's this big difference. You'll say, and people go, yeah, yeah, whatever. You're American. And you're like, no, 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 very different. Very different from Americans. We're not American, not American, right? And sometimes as Canadians, we do that. We try to say what we're not rather than say what we are. And if you think about the example that I gave of the fish and the fishbowl surrounded by water, um, the, the fish knows it's surrounded by it. The fish knows it's in it. Um, but like culture, um, the fish can't really directly point to one thing and say, well, that's the water, you know, much like, you know, your own culture, whatever your culture is, um, you, you have certain cultural, um, symbols and cultural understanding and cultural beliefs and cultural, whatever foods and so forth. Um, though they may be an aspect of it, they are not the sole definition of it. So... Language. Language is our thing. Language is our transmission of culture. It is our communication. It is what we use to share our culture and not necessarily share our culture with other people outside of our culture, but rather to, to share our culture within um, from one generation to the next. If you remember my friend with the really, really awesome mustache who talked about um, our human journey and our evolution way back earlier in the module and um, he talked about how animals genetically pass on knowledge from one generation to the next. We don't do that. We can't do that. That's not part of our makeup. It's not part of how we pass on our learnings and our understandings. Rather, our, our learnings and understandings are passed on through our communication. And that communication is language. And so, um, again, I'm having a deja vu thing because I've said this a million times before. But um, I say the word apple. I say the word cow. I say the word trampoline you immediately conjure an idea in your head of what I'm talking about. I didn't say red apple or green apple or golden apple. That's something that you start to bring in. So your cognition and your reality kind of is brought into that. Um, because I just simply give you a broad definition or a broad term, I may be thinking red, but the minute I say apple, I say I think red apple, you think green apple. There's a, a part of your history that plays into that. And so when you talk about language and transmission of culture through language, it's very explicit. It's very definite. It's very, um, this is what it is in this language specifically to that. So um, as a father of three little ones, they have a lot of why questions. You know, why does the rain fall? You know, why does the snow fall? Why is the moon there? Why is the sun over there? You know, why do we have to get up? Um, you know, things like that. And, and so... As, as a parent, I have to be very explicit in my explanations because if I'm not, the why questions start to kind of go into, well, why, 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 you know, because this, because that, well, why is that? And, and so, you know, that's, that's the transmission of knowledge from one generation to the next. And if it's not explicit and the language is not definite and clear, it can be very, very interesting in the results that you get. Having said that... <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there is a, a very, very interesting part of language that we tend to neglect in the sense that um, where you come from and what your reality is 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 basically um, tied into your understanding of language. So I say the word snow. If you've never seen snow in your life, snow means nothing to you. You don't. You just think white stuff. Yeah, I've seen pictures of snow. Uh, if you live in the mountains or you're a skier and I say snow and you're like, well, what kind of snow? Is it powder? You know, is it crunchy snow? Is it kind of like icy snow? Right? And, and so the word snow is very, very complex to someone who understands. Um, and that's the, the beauty and the, the danger of language because misunderstanding can often misrepresent. Um, norms are the rules associated with a culture, and that also shows up in sociology, so you'll hear the word norms again. But norms are basically the rules for behavior, the, how a culture transmits its um, understandings is partly through um, an orderly, stable, predictable pattern of behavior. Um, and so norms are, well, you know, you cover your mouth when you sneeze or cough, um, it used to be with your hand, that's changed now, the, the norm has changed from covering your mouth with your hand to coughing into your elbow. Um, this w wasn't somebody who got arrested for it, you know, but, but people went, oh, don't do that, that's gross, do it this way. And then, you know, that's how it changes, that's how the norms kind of transform. Um, 
this is, this is how some cultures are defined by their norms, by their values, by their beliefs, by how they behave. Um, and it's very easy to, to look down on a culture, especially when their behaviors don't necessarily match your behaviors. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, see, I try, I, you can't see it, but I actually coughed into my elbow and it's kind of weird. Um, but it's, it's interesting because um, when one culture's norms tend to clash with another culture's norms, you have problems. Um, and, and then you start to see friction between cultures. Now, again, here you see the word folkways, more as uh, taboos, rituals, and so forth. These are all parts of the normal behavior. In some cases, it can be, you know, anything from uh, uh, somebody does something and you're like, don't ever do that again, you know, to somebody does something and people go, wow, um, you're a criminal and you're going to go to jail. And so norms can be sanctioned, which means like controlled, and passed on from the, oh, yes, that's the right way to behave, to, oh, you shouldn't really behave that way, to, oh, okay, well, you're going to go to jail now, kind of um, reinforcing the rules and the norms and the values and the beliefs of a group. Um, deviance, speaking of, of people who get arrested, um, deviance is not a bad thing. In fact, norms require deviance, and you're going to see what I mean in a second. A deviant is someone who just isn't like everybody else. And it's not just one person. Usually it's a group within this larger cultural group. Deviance is a good thing. It's diversity within a group. And it's good to have diversity within a group because if you know anything about like an animal called a lemming, uh, lemmings follow the leader. And if the leader falls off a cliff, the rest of the lemmings will follow. You do want deviants within that lemming group deviants who say, we're not going that way, we're going to walk this way. Um, deviants who kind of say, you know, I'm not going to drink goat's milk anymore. That was a that was a deviant who said, I'm going to milk a cow and drink cow's milk. And people went, whoa, you can't do that, right? And they're like, oh, well, I'm going to try it anyway, if you don't like me. They're like, well, you can't live with us anymore because you're a cow person and we're goat people. Um, you know, these are deviants and, and this creates diversity. It's not a bad thing because diversity allows for new growth and interest and in some cases development. And sometimes the deviants develop far more than the mainstream do, the norms do. Um, and so that's very, very important. Um, and that creates social disorganization because within a culture, you do want some, even though, yes, it's all uniform and homogeneous, you do want deviants. It's an important part of of a cultural group. It's it's an important part because it offers just a, a bit of difference because you never know. Maybe the, the deviants, that small group of people who do things differently, are actually the ones who are doing it right. And so sometimes that's very important. I have other things here like cultural um, structural strain theory and uh, control theory and uh, Marxist theories, value conflict. Um, this 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 is all kind of stuff that that ties into and again i'll talk about this in the sociology unit but just understand that deviance is is not necessarily a, a bad thing it's it's actually in some cases a very good thing um, not to say that criminals are great but sometimes you know once upon a time somebody came along and said hey the earth is in the center of the universe and people went criminal right um until we actually found out that he was right you know so sometimes you know these people who might have been criminals are actually forward thinkers and deviant um, values values are an important part of a um, a society because values are the things that we hold in high esteem things that we hold dear um, things that are important to a culture um, some cultures value athletes, some cultures value artists, some cultures value religion, some cultures value the intricacies of language. Um, it, it could be other things too, right? Like you'll see here, I give you examples, like North Americans will, will um, they may disagree on certain things, but they value things like liberty and freedom and independence and individual rights. Um, but that's not to say that everyone does, you know, these are just certain groups within a culture. But primarily, they're kind of similar. They run along parallel lines. Um, Self-discipline, um, equity, equality, opportunity, love, compassion, religion, nationalism, patriotism, health, education. These are all things that are, are values. These are, are things that 
we look at and say, yeah, that's good stuff. You know, um, that's an important part of a culture's um, understanding. It also helps to shape the norms. It also helps to shape the language, right? When I say things like equality and people go, oh yeah, that's a good thing, right? I, again, it's very strange because it's language. I say equality and people go, that's a wonderful thing. Um, in other parts of the world, they say equality and like, are you kidding me? You don't want to be equal with everyone else. Equality means, you know, you're all living in a cesspool. Um, sometimes equality isn't, isn't a good thing. You know, if I was to go into a room full of wealthy businessmen and said equality and they, you know, they'd throw me out, right? Because well, they don't want equality. They want to be better than everyone else, right? Um, that's a very interesting part of, of the value system that we have. Um, and again, it's tied very, very closely to cultural beliefs, understandings, norms. Um, group values tend to complement and support one another. You see here, they tend to be in agreement, right? We, and yet, interestingly enough, we have values that are also contradictory. Um, and so we have an idea of, of values that we have. And, and you'll see here what I'm talking about where we talk about this idea of, in, in North America, we talk about this idea of, of equity and, and justice. And the minute I say the word justice, everyone thinks, yeah, right, justice is a good thing. Um, but at the same time, we also have laws. And if you know anything about the law, there's nothing just about it. There is no justice in law. And yet we look at the laws and justice and, and equate them as the same thing. But when you truly understand the language behind it, Anyone who truly understands sees that we have we value justice and we value law, but we don't necessarily value them as the same thing because there is no equity there. There's no equality between justice and law. Um, and that's just one example, right? We value health, we value medicine. Sometimes medicine doesn't promote health, right? And so these are, are things that we have. We have sets of values and they should run parallel, but oftentimes they kind of butt into each other and, and disagree. Um, and so it's very important to kind of see this idea that um, we have values within our society. We have values within our culture. And yes, they are similar, but these are often the causes of a great deal of cultural conflict within the same culture. Not even uh, uh, two cultures on the outside. It's within one culture. You do start to see a clash of values. Beliefs are, are other things that, that we hold true within cultures. And I say we because every culture even Canadian culture has beliefs that, that it holds to be true. Um, and it's not necessarily just religion. It has nothing in some cases to do with anything with religion. Um, as Canadians, we have what we consider to be a common knowledge that, you know, everyone has the right to, to health care. You know, Canadians believe very fervently in our health care. Our health care is important to us. Our education is important to us. If we don't have our health care and education, we're like the Americans, right? Or, you know, I'm just using that as an example, but Canadians value their health care. It's, it's, it's fundamental to who we are, right? And that's not to say other groups don't or other parts of the world don't, but I'm just going to kind of speak to, to Canada in the sense that we have these beliefs. We have these ideas that they're fundamental to us, to our core as a culture. Um, and it's, it's amazing because then you start to see um, this this idea that other people don't see it the way you do. And so then you start to see the relativity of it all. Um, we, we value women, we value children. If you remember um, back in the day, I showed you, and when I say back in the day, I really mean at the start of the term, where I had you watch this video where Bill Nye was talking about abortion. Um, and, and you see this idea that there's there are beliefs and there are beliefs about abortion. now whether you agree or disagree with it, or if you think it's right or you think it's wrong, you have a belief that associates with that. And amazingly enough, there is no absolute right or wrong. It's just, I fervently believe in abortion, or I fervently believe that, that abortion is wrong, and you can't tell me otherwise. And, and these are beliefs that, that, uh, that run within a culture, and not necessarily, again, mainstream, where everyone believes one thing, um, because you often have deviance. Um, so here's some Canadian ideologies, things that are beliefs that we have. We believe in, in capitalism, right? Like everyone can work and make money. 
we have a fundamental um, belief in Christianity, but that has a great deal to do with our, our history. So that, that is almost intrinsic in our Canadian development and who we are as a Canadian culture. But we also value multiculturalism. Um, by the same token, we value nationalism, which kind of doesn't really tie in with the idea of multiculturalism because if you're nationalist, then you're all the same and you all, you're all Canadian, but people within Canada don't identify as Canadian first. They'll identify as their home culture first or their home nationality first and then Canadian. You know, I'm, I'm Italian Canadian, right? They don't say I'm, a, I'm Canadian Italian, I'm Italian Canadian, um, you know, or I'm Greek Canadian, or I'm Chinese Canadian. Um, we always put our, our home ethnicity first and then Canadian second. And so, yes, we're fervently Canadian, but sometimes we're not, you know, and again, these beliefs are kind of, they're almost like uh, two sides of a coin, so to speak, heads and tails. Um, and then we also believe in socialism. We uh, have an idea that the government has to take care of its people. And so this is part of our belief and translates into our government system, which becomes our ideology. And that's what ideology means, by the way. Um, I'm trying to do this very fast because I've done this many, many times already. And so um, ideology really is um, that belief which turns into a system of government. Social collectives are groups and communities and institutions within a culture, within a group. Um, and so we have organizations and communities within our Canadian culture, our Canadian ethnicity. Um, we have um, people who play hockey and you know anyone who's like a, a hockey person, there's a whole sub-community of hockey families and hockey parents and hockey kids. And then you've got, you know, rugby people who you know are have their own community and have their own little gatherings um, you've got people who are part of a band and part of like a, i don't know uh, the burlington teen tour band for example if you're from burlington you know what i'm talking about where you're band people um you have dance people right there i mean they, they make tv shows about this stuff they have like dance moms right what's a dance mom what's a soccer mom right but these are our our collectives these are our groups within our culture that are part of the greater culture. And it's not to say that they see themselves as different, but they're created within that culture and then they, they almost like become an entity of their own, so to speak. And so these are the social collectives that we have within cultures. And some of them can be, you know, based on sports, some can be on art, some can be on whatever, just uh, some kind of a connection. And we do that as a species, as humans. We we create these connections and they could go anywhere from, again, athletics to arts to political to religious to language. Um, I don't know, like if there's like a, uh, a gathering of people who speak only Latin and, you know, want to chat with the Pope. Um, statuses and roles are also a significant part of our society. Now, try to understand this, that social status, or sorry, a cultural status and a group of people, um, and again, we're kind of, kind of crossing the line from anthropology into sociology, but you can't really separate the two. It's like a Venn diagram. There, there will always be a great deal of overlap. But we see status and roles within cultures, within a group of people. Now, what is status? Um, status is not like, you know, you have more money than someone else. It doesn't mean that you're better than other people or you have a lower status or you're, you're lesser. Far from it. Um, status is is part of a group, of belonging to a group. It's part of um, almost like being um, a part, I don't want to say of a group, but it's belonging. There's the word I'm looking for, right? And it's belonging, and you start from the belonging, to, from the belonging, from belonging to anywhere from a, a group of people on a team, your family, your extended family, your school, part of a community, part of a religious group, you hold the status within it, right? And that status is everywhere from, oh, you're so-and-so's kid, right? Um, that's that's part of your status. And and I, I mean, I can speak to myself. At one point I was, you know, everyone associated me from, oh, oh you're his brother. Right? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm his brother, right? To, oh, you're her husband. Yeah, yeah, that's me. Oh, you're so, like, it happened to me, I swear to you, this is really what happened. Last week I went to pick up my daughter and they're like, oh, you're Helena's dad. I'm like, yep, here I go. I, my status has changed because I'm now, I've no longer gone from my brother's brother to my, my wife's husband. Now I'm my daughter's father, 
right? And so people start to create that status. They've given me a title. It's a badge that, you know, I stick on my chest. And so I've got all these different name tags and the name tags change my status and where I belong, right? And, and that also gives me a position within the group, right? And it's an achievement, so to speak. Um, if I'm a coach, for example, uh, there's an, an immediate status that goes with it. Um, there's also a point where as a coach, you know, I, I tell people what to do and they, they don't question it because I'm the coach, right? Um, so I belong to a group, but I'm also a player. So if I play on a team, you know, I, I change my status. I'm no longer giving the orders, but I'm taking the orders. Um, I'm an employee, so I'm not the boss, but I am the boss. So I'm running the class and I'm running the course. So I'm the boss of the course. But at the same time, when I'm in a group full, you know, with a group of teachers and we're looking and talking to a bunch of principals, I'm no longer the, bo the boss. Um, and so it changes, right? And, and that happens to you and it happens to everyone. And these statuses and roles are all understood. You know, you don't walk into a crowd and they immediately give you your status. Here's your name badge. Well, sometimes they do, but, um, you know, here, here's where you are and here's where you stand. And here's where you're on the pecking order or the totem pole or whatever you want to call it, the social pyramid. It, it's, it's all very fluid. It's all constantly moving. And these statuses and roles often change. They change from the minute you leave a group and join a group to the time you go home and interact with your parents to when you hang out with your friends to when you play on a team to when you join the band to when you go to your doctor's office all of these things your status immediately changes and that's where you see the multiplicity of statuses because as an individual you hold many statuses right and it has sometimes something to do with your age sometimes your sex sometimes your class sometimes your race sometimes your prestige right uh, you're, you're the captain of the team right um, sometimes it has to do with money but don't ever make the mistake, and I have to warn you of this, don't ever make the mistake of thinking status is only one thing. So for example, a lot of people associate wealth with status, and that's very, very dangerous ground because just because someone has money doesn't make the, give them status. And so it's very, very important. That's why you see the thing status and consistency here because <coughs> everyone's status is inconsistent. And people go, well, like Donald Trump. Like, yeah, Donald Trump still has somebody he has to answer to. And there's somebody who's richer than Donald Trump and someone who has more money and more power and more of this than Donald Trump. So even though Donald Trump may seem like big stuff to us, or maybe not, um, he's little stuff to somebody else. And so, again, it's very, very fluid. I hope you're understanding what I'm talking about when I, when I talk about that. Um, roles are also, and statuses are also, when, whenever you have a role, uh, or sorry, whenever you have status, there's also an associated role that goes with it, right? And so um, the minute you're given a higher status, you're some, sometimes or usually given a greater responsibility or a greater task to go with it. And so just because you sit higher up also means that there's more expected from you. And so roles will define who you are and they define your status. And the higher the status, the greater the role. Um, and so sometimes you don't want really a high status because that also means you got to do more. Um, and, and that's very, very important, especially within a culture and a society and, and a group of people. People don't always want to be the, the one who's, you know, being looked to. Or, you know, sometimes they don't always be the one who's, who's being overlooked. Um, and so that changes. And what you see here, roles are negotiated and produced during interaction um, where you don't necessarily sit down with people and go, okay, well, I'm going to be the boss and you're going to follow what I'm saying. Um, but... But it, you start to almost, like, without ever saying it, you start to negotiate it and create it. Um, think about your, your friends, and I'll give you a really good example. You hang out with a group of friends. You have one person who's, who's just always the decision maker. You know, we'll call them the deciders, right? Uh, where are we going to go? Oh, we're going to go there, right? And everyone's like, yeah, okay, right? They just don't want to listen to this person complain and whine because once upon a time, you all went out and that person did nothing but complain and bitch about, you know, I hate this place and blah, blah. And everyone said, okay, fine. From now on, just let this person decide because I just don't want to listen to them complain, right? Um, you, you eventually just, well, you don't discuss it, but in your heads, you're all thinking the same thing. So you just follow along. Um, and you have people who are, who are the followers. So people are like, I just don't care. Let's just go somewhere. I'm good, right? These roles are, are negotiated and, and not often explicitly. Um, and that's very, very important because... Um, the negotiation of these roles, they develop how we behave within a culture, within a group, within a social group. 
um, and and all of this stuff. And, and again, I'm really really simplifying. But if you ever go on to study anthropology, you'll see what I'm talking about. Or if you ever watch nature shows, nature shows are actually a really really good way to understand status and roles because with humans there's a greater complexity. But if you look at statuses and roles within the animal kingdom, it's quite amazing. And many of you probably have seen these Discovery Channel shows or these Animal Planet shows or whatever shows where you see like the alpha male, right? They didn't sit down and have a discussion or a vote who's going to be the alpha male or who's going to be the dominant female. Um, these roles and statuses within the animal world are actually sometimes cr uh, brought about through violence and negotiation of that violence or posturing or who, you know, who's showing off their fangs the most or who's pushing the other, other animals around or you know, who gets the food first. That, that is a very, very great uh, demonstration of status and roles within a group that doesn't have language. Um, and that really helps you understand how that the culture of that species is, is brought about and how everyone behaves based on that. Um, one of the most amazing things I saw was when I was watching this uh, person, she's a, she's a primatologist, she went and studied gorillas and uh, one of the things that she did was one of the silverback gorillas, one of the, these big monstrous gorillas, um, one of the things that you never do with a gorilla is make eye contact, right? Because that's a, that's a sign of aggression, right? Um, and so when, when the, the alpha male came along, you know, she kind of did what all the other gorillas did, is kind of put your head down, right? And cower to, the, to the, this obviously beast of, a, of an animal. Um, and probably not a good idea as a human to ever kind of make eye contact with a gorilla. But so she did, and, and, and what they do is they kind of take grass and they kind of chew on it, right, with their heads down. Um, and this is a, a definition of, okay, well, I'm subservient to you, and even though we're not going to discuss it, I'm just going to sit here and chew my grass, and you just walk past me and don't ever hurt me again, please, right? And that's, that's how you create this, um, this status within the group, and it was understanding. And she, she did such an awesome job of explaining why she did it and how all the other animals did it and how you determine your status within that group. And just because you have the one alpha boss doesn't mean you have subcategories, right? You have other people who are higher up beneath the big guy, right? And so even though she's sitting there munching the grass, you know, she, she still isn't, you know, she's human and she has capabilities, but she still sits below some of the other apes and gorillas who could easily, you know, rip her to shreds. Um, and it's very, very fascinating. Cultural integration is um, very, very fascinating because it's especially when you're looking at people who have um, a multicultural background. And in Canada, it's, it's very unique because Canada, if you look at the history of, of how Canada came about, started off as a colony and as a trading post. And at one point we had Vikings here, but they didn't really last very long. And I'm just talking about European settlers. I'm not even talking about the, the indigenous peoples. Um, but the indigenous peoples play a significant role in our Canadian culture. Um, and so then the Europeans came and you have the French and you also have the Dutch and then you have the English and you still have the Aboriginal um, peoples who are here. And each of these groups have eventually, at some point or another, created this diverse culture that we call Canadian. There is a history. There are subcultures within this group. And, you know, if you're French Canadian, you're far different from uh, English Canadian. And the French Canadians consider themselves very different. <coughs> Excuse me. Aboriginal Canadian and, and Métis and so forth. And, and you see that there's a very, very um, intricate, intricately woven pattern within one large culture. And as more people come to Canada <clears throat> and have come over, over the span of the past 150 years when Canada was, was considered a country, as you see, th they've developed diversity within what is the greater Canada, the greater Canadian culture. And that all plays into who we are today. And as more people come, that will change. And so the Canadian I'm doing like the air quotes, the Canadian that might have been here in, let's say, like the turn of the century, the turn of the 1900s, is vastly different from the Canadian, again, 
air quotes, from the Canadian who would have been typical in the 1950s to air quotes Canadian again to the year 2000. And, you know, God only knows in the year 2050, what will a Canadian look like? And when, I, mean, I don't even mean what they look like physically, but what kind of a culture, or how, how will a Canadian culture be based on all this integration and people coming in and in some way, shape or form influencing the flow of, of Canadian culture? And so these groups are subcultures, not to be confused with deviants. Um, subcultures are large groups that exist within society. And these are not necessarily um, going against the culture, um, but there are cultures. Now, again, understand that subcultures are easily recognizable within a culture, but from the outside, subcultures don't exist. Everyone's the same. And I'm going to sound incredibly racist here, but I'm going to say that if we look out, you know, let's just look south of the border and all Americans are the same. And yes, if you've been to the States, they are very fast and very, very diverse and very, very different, even in their accents and the way they speak. If you heard someone with a New York accent, you know, to someone with a Southern accent, to someone from the East Coast or someone from the West Coast, the same language is, and again, I'm using language as, as an exhibition of a subculture, but they may seem homogeneous to the outside, to the typical outsider who looks at them as all being Americans, but you know, go in and examine them quite well and you'll see that in fact within that large homogeneous group there are smaller subcultures, which are still quite large, but smaller groups that are subcultures which are distinct, unique, and though they're American, they're not like New York Americans, the, the South Carolina Americans, or the Florida Americans, or the the Louisiana Americans and so forth. These are all, and, and I'm kind of using states to kind of help you frame in your mind what that means. Um, in Canada, we have three ethnic subcultures and they're English, French, and Chinese. Um, the demographics are constantly changing. So that, you know, in 10 years will be quite different, I'm sure. Um, it's easy to kind of stereotype people within their ethnic cultures. Um, sub, sorry, subcultures, but um, it's also not fair because it's not fair to simply say that you are, all Chinese Canadians are the same. They're not. Not English Canadian. Not all English Canadians are the same. Not all French Canadians are the same. If you've ever been to Quebec, yes, they all seem, from an outsider's point of view, very different. Uh, talk to the Quebecois, and they'll, they, they, you know, they are very different. Uh, true story. Um, I. I a long time ago, I, I knew a, a woman from Holland, an elderly woman, and um, she uh, she used to come into my office and we would talk all the time. And I don't know how the topic came up one day, and I said to her, um, she, from Holland, so very, very Dutch, with a very, very thick Dutch accent. And, uh, I, you know, I, I would say, oh, you know, I, I have another client, and uh, she's uh, there, and she's like, oof. She's Southern Dutch. I'm like, oh, oh, that's a thing, <laughs> right? Here I am being ignorant as a Canadian going, what's, Holland is like the size of a postage stamp. Are you kidding me? What, how, how can you have diversity within Holland? Love God. And she's like, oh, no, no, the Northern Dutch are very different from the Southern Dutch. And I was like, really? <laughs> you know, here I am going, that's fascinating. Tell me more, right? So she went on to explain the, the very, very intricate differences between the northern Dutch and the southern Dutch. And I wouldn't even know where to separate Holland into the north and south. But, you know, this is a thing. And, and these are segmented subcultures within a very, very, well, in this case, small piece of land compared to Canada, but, but segmented and, and unique and different, as different as, you know, Anyone who would say that, that people from, from the east coast of Canada are the same as people from the west coast of Canada, and night and day, I mean, night and day, we as Canadians go, oh yeah, that's for sure, right? Um, but it, it's how we are. It, these are subcultures within the greater culture. And so you see here, I've got the, you know, the um, Canadian regional subcultures, and this is totally a joke, by the way. Um, but 
but you look and you see things like and in, in, in very many derogatory ways like you know people who live in Quebec just love poutine right and people who live on the east coast they talk funny um, and they drink a lot of beer and, and, and people in, in southern Ontario you know we, we all just think we're the center of the universe you know anyone who lives in in Saskatchewan or Manitoba is probably a farmer and anyone who lives in in um, Alberta is probably a skier lives in the mountains and similarly you know in BC everyone's a hippie right and everyone who lives up here is just you know drives a dog sled it's not fair but these are our subcultures within Canada anyway um, so that's that I've wrapped it up I think hopefully and thank God this time the this actually ran right to the end so um, yeah this is it this is the last bit of the module um, there's one small assignment that goes with it and basically all I'm gonna ask you to do oh no wait two small assignments um, one is just to read uh, an article and define Canadian culture and so based on what you've learned here and a little bit of your own research I'm asking you to kind of tell me what is Canadian culture and though it sounds relatively simple, it's, it can be quite hard, especially when you stop and think about what, what makes Canadians Canadians. Um, the second part is I'm going to um, share a documentary with you and basically ask you to, to stop your ethnocentric lens and to look at it and really examine it from two sides. Examine it from, from the one side and examine it from the other side. And I don't want to give it away, um, but, but in light of a lot of the stuff that's going on with uh, Donald Trump in the States, um, and you know his travel bans. I think this is really, really good because, you know, in our history and in our culture, we start to see you know a lot of the uh, this misunderstanding, cultural misunderstanding, and our ethnocentrism and our idea that our culture is better than another culture. And um, this this documentary does a really, really good job of making you stop and just look and say, okay, well, though I, I may not agree, um, I have to step back and, and try to understand. And so um, hopefully that will kind of create thought and dialogue. So you'll see the stuff will come up. Anyway, um, March break is coming up next weekend. Actually, Friday's a PD day. Um, this module officially ends on Friday, but if you need the weekend to wrap stuff up, by all means, I just, I'm not going to ask anybody to do stuff over March break. I think that's unreasonable. Um, and so yeah, I'd like to wrap this module up and anthropology up by the time we go into March break. And when we get back, we'll go right into psychology right after March break and I, I know a lot of people on the other side of the lecture are going woo right because everyone loves psychology and I do too um, so yeah have a good one have a good week uh, enjoy the documentary hopefully it'll it'll get a few people's um, blood boiling and and hopefully it'll get people to kind of start to really examine things and, and really look at culture for what it is and and how vast and intricate cultures can be